Well, Brian, the odds makers set the over under of Colorado wins during this abbreviated season at one and a half. They've played two games and they've already gone over Colorado 35, Stanford 32. Buffalo's had the, the lead for the final 48 minutes plus in that game, but it got a little interesting late. Yeah, second game in a row we've seen that where they've gotten a big lead and uh, and left the team back the other team back in it. So that's something that you want to correct. But hey, like you said, the over under is one and a half. If one of your biggest problems right now is letting teams back into games, that's pretty good because you know there were a lot of people that didn't think the Buffs would be in a lot of games this this year. So if one of the biggest problems is letting teams back in, they're in good shape. Obviously, CU fans were pumped about Sam Noyer's performance in the opener. He comes out against Stanford, and he has even a better passer rating in this game than he did in the first game. Two passing touchdowns, two rushing touchdowns. The first buff quarterback to do that in the same game since Seth Alufau in 2015. But, Brian, the, the man just does not want to slide. <laughs> He's a competitor out there. On two separate occasions, once again, he tries, tries to hurdle a defender. Yeah, both he and Coach Terrell since last week said Sam needs to be smarter. Well, he wasn't smarter. Um, he, uh, there was one time that uh, you know he went up and he didn't really come down because the, the defender kind of caught him in midair. Uh, but, hey, that's his style. And I, I, I had to say, I know it's the smart thing, but we listened to his teammates this week that you know, you know Frank Phillips said, I got my second win when I saw him doing that. In some ways, maybe you don't want him to slide because if he's going to inspire your teammates, then – Obviously, you want him healthy, but you know if he's going to run like that and it, it inspires people, I almost say keep doing it. I mean, it's a short season, and that's how he plays, and I, I like it. Yeah, and if that's what he needs, you remember Brett Favre, and I'm not comparing Sam Noyer to Brett Favre, but <laughs> he was he was going to do a few things that you were kind of unconventional for a quarterback, but it worked for him. And Sam has that that moxie. Maybe maybe you can't dial that back. I don't know. Uh, apparently, his nickname is Chef. Neuer D. <laughs> and he was also called Neuer the, the, Neuer the Destroyer on the broadcast. Well, what, what are your thoughts there? Maybe he should be named after a famous hurdler. Well, see, these are things that I don't get by, uh, by being in the press box. I didn't get that on the – I didn't hear the broadcast. So uh, that's interesting. Uh, I, I, I don't have any opinion on those. those <laughs> yeah, who knows what these kids, uh, kids call each other. But, you know, I, I think uh, – you know, Sam, uh, what he what he has done so far is, uh, you know, proven – I guess he's cooked up some good offense here in the yeah. first two weeks. There, there's a transition for you. But, um, I mean, honestly, I, I just tweeted this out before we did this video, Adam. Um, the biggest concern about this team coming in was no experience at quarterback, right? And so far, they're, they're, they graduated their top two receivers. They're without Alex Fontenot. They're without uh, Katie Nixon so far this season. He's without his center today, plays most of the game without Brady Russell, and all he's done is put up almost 1,000 yards and 83 points and two wins in two games. So, you know, the kid's playing well. Uh, you know, give him credit. There was a lot of questions about him coming in, but two games in, he's looked really good. He did throw a pick earlier, early in the game, but part of that was there wasn't good protection. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Chance Lytle kind of let a, you know, a guy by him and, and rush the pass. But, you know, aside from that pass by Neuer and that pressure – uh, you know, the old line has been pretty flawless this year. It's just, it's incredible. I don't think Kari Kush had ever practiced at center. I mean, they had four other guys slated to play that position this preseason and all those guys were out today. Yeah, it, it was amazing. I mean, watching pregame warmups, uh, you know, I was, you know, looking for uh, Josh Giants, how he was going to look. And I kept like, okay, where's Josh? And, uh, you know, yeah, we see it every game that, that, um, that you go to. We see it every game that uh, the three quarterbacks, are working with three centers, right? And uh, Brendan Lewis uh, didn't have a center to snap to. He uh, stood there by himself on air, and as, the, as the, the quarterbacks took snaps and dropped back, he just kept holding the ball and dropped back and did it without a center. So they had Kari Kutch and John Deichman, uh, the walk-on, as the two guys practicing snaps before the game. And so, you know, I mean, Colby Purcell obviously out. Josh Chines, we don't know what's going on with him. Um, didn't get a chance to ask Terrell. Um, after the game, and uh, Austin Johnson, who was on the uh, the depth chart before the season, has been out, and not sure what his injury is. But yeah, Kari Kutch stepped in there, and uh, I thought a couple of the snaps were were a little off, but uh, oh, nothing that was devastating that uh, led to a fumble or anything like that. And I thought he played well. And Cannon Ray got a little action in there. Good to see him back in the mix. Um, 
Jarek Broussard, again over 100 yards. Late in the, the third quarter, it was a really impressive drive by him. He, he ran the ball six times on that drive, 17-yard run on that drive, 18-yard run on that drive, and that set up a touchdown, put them up 35-16. Obviously, Fontenot was the top back until he got hurt. Mangum has got potential. We saw a shot Clayton for the first time, but Broussard – He's not going to be, be removed from that top back job anytime soon. Maybe, you know, not for the rest of his career. If he keeps running like this, stays healthy. I mean, he's looked like an all-conference back this year. Just an incredible story overall. Yeah, and I mean, third player in CU history to rush for over uh, 100 yards in his first two games as a buff and the first one to do it since Marcus Houston. And I know that name doesn't sit well with a lot of people, but um, Charlie Davis was the other one. And, you know, Broussard, uh, of those three, most yards in the first two games. And, you know, it, it was interesting because uh, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, for a good chunk of this game early on, I'm like, I can't believe that they're not feeding Broussard after what they did uh, last week and how good he was. But he winds up with 27 carries after having 31 last week. And um, in some ways, maybe that was by design that they thought, hey, let's kind of mix things up early and then save Broussard for late in the game. I don't know if that was by design, but um, if it was, it was kind of genius by the buffs because uh, uh, by the time the second half rolled around, there was Broussard. He was the guy, and he was, and that's where he got most of his yards. I don't know how many he had in the second half, but I know most of them were there. Um, uh, you know, Jaron Mangum, not a not a big game of running the ball, but he did score a touchdown. I thought he had some decent runs. It looked better than he did last week for sure. You mentioned Katie Nixon uh, did not play warmed up again. Uh, a kind of a strange deal. It's it's rare to see somebody go out there and warm up back-to-back games and not play. I know hamstring injuries are kind of a different type deal. Uh, but Dimitri Stanley really sparked the offense there early on, catches a, a short pass and just outruns everybody on the Stanford defense. We knew he had speed, and uh, he, he's been a, a key for them early on this season. I know Neuer's trying to spread it around a little bit, but he's really developed into a safety blanket. Yeah, he really has. I mean, the first time I ever met Dimitri was actually after uh, the state track meet um, when I saw him run sprints. So he's pretty quick, and he showed that on the, on that pass play. Um, you know, back to Katie Nixon, I watched him in warm-ups. He looked great. Um, I don't know why he didn't play. I was surprised by that. But, um, yeah, coming into this season, there's a lot of things we've talked about before, Adam, that um, it's almost like we don't know this team, right, <laughs> by the way we're predicting. And, I mean, receiver-wise, I thought, Hey, Katie Nixon's going to have a big year. Daniel Arias is going to have a huge year. But it's been Dimitri Stanley, and it's been Brendan Rice, and today with Vontae Chenault. Uh, But to me, the big story is Dimitri Stanley. He's played exceptional the first two games. I think that's the only prediction I've gotten right so far. I had him (laughs) as my breakout pick, and obviously some of my other predictions haven't panned out so well. So uh, I had to go on Twitter and and announce that I had called him my breakout offense player because I'm not – again, I don't have – much else to hang my hat on at this point after two games. Uh, with, the, with the receiver sticking there, Fonte Chenault back in the mix catches his first three passes as a buff. Brandon Rice catches his first touchdown pass as a buff. And he, we even had a Jalen Jackson sighting out there. But Brian, drops are still an issue. I understand you're not going to catch every single ball, but that percentage has been too high through two games. Yeah, it really has. And, you know, Brandon Rice uh... – <laughs> he better have caught that touchdown pass. I mean, he was wide open and he almost dropped it, you know, but uh, you know, he was able to haul that in, but you know, a great play by the buffs and, but yeah, drops have, have been an issue so far. Uh, they've got to get that fixed. And you, know, you kind of expect that maybe with, with young receivers, but that's something that's got to get fixed. And maybe this is the year to get that fixed, right? You can live with some drops in a year like this uh, that doesn't, uh, doesn't count, I guess, as far as eligibility. And uh, as long as you're winning games, deal with those drops and get it fixed. But uh, yeah, certainly the percentage is too high at this point. Brady Russell was knocked out early in the game. We didn't get a chance to talk to Carl Durrell about that after the game. Again, these, these post-game press conferences are so short and there's just not a whole lot of time. You've got people asking kind of random questions that don't really fit in with the game. Um, But Russell did go on Twitter. He says, uh, Oh, I'll be back quick. I'm tough as nails. So uh, that's good news because CU has some other serviceable tight ends, but there's a clear, that's one of those positions where there's a pretty clear drop off from your top guy to the rest of the, the, the depth at that position. Yeah, for sure. And I watched Brady Russell try to give it a go. Um, you know, look like it was his right ankle, um, tried to give it a go th- uh, throughout the rest of the first half, but uh, just couldn't do it. I think Matt Lynch uh, does a good job, um, but you know, they used a lot of two tight end sets 
after Russell went out with uh, him and CJ Shemansky got in there for his first action. I'm trying to make up for no Russell. And, um, you know, you saw, you know, not that production from the tight end that we saw last week. I think they're getting, they're missing Russell. Um, they need him back quickly. And um, hopefully he is tough as nails because, uh, you know, I know Sam Neuer would love to have him back. Got to praise Darren Cheverini's play calling again. This is, you know, the first game this season where the other team has some tape on what they want to do offensively. And he took a little criticism on social media, just uh, getting a little conservative late. But if Jared Broussard converts that late fourth down run, which he was really close to doing so, I don't think anybody's doing that. It's easy to second guess there. I, I mean, you look at it, red zone offense has been a major issue for this program for so many years uh, in the last 15 or so, it seems like a reoccurring theme. Brian, they're 10 for 10 in the red zone right now with nine touchdowns. It's If you're going to criticize the play calling, I feel like you're really nitpicking at this point. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, Carl Durrell said after the game that um, he wanted to run three times there. So I think, you know, in a situation like that, the head coach has uh, some say in what's going to go on there. But yeah, like to your original point, uh, credit Darren Chivarini. He's done a great job through two games. Uh, we mentioned all the guys that they're missing on offense. Well, you know, Sam Nori deserves credit, but so does Darren Shiverini because he's uh, managed to uh, lead this offense to uh, 83 points in two games. Um, he's doing a great job. And I did think they got conservative in the fourth quarter. I don't believe they threw a pass in three possessions in the fourth quarter. I'd have, I may be off on that, but um, I don't believe they did. Uh, I thought they got a little conservative and maybe could have tried to put up another uh, score there in one of those early drives, but you know, give him credit. He's done, he's done a great job and called some good plays, and um, the Buffs are rolling right now offensively. And Cheverini also, well, I believe, was the first one to call Sam Neuer when the coaching change took place. He saw something in Sam's skill set that he thought, you know, would, would fit really well in, into his system. So uh, that's another thing that he, that he did that, that's really worked out well for this program. On yeah, def- just go ahead. Yeah, 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 I was going to say, it's, re- it's really interesting how that's all worked out because – um, and not to discredit Sam, but I think uh, I don't want to speak for you, but I, I think that you and I both were kind of under the impression or under the assumption it was going to be Tyler Lytle's job and that Sam was kind of being brought back um, for sort of a depth purpose. That was my thought. Anyway. I don't want to mm-hmm. speak for you, but I thought Neuer was being brought back to compete, but basically be uh, a, a veteran depth behind Tyler Lytle. But they saw something in Sam and it's worked out. And we didn't see Tyler Lytle out there today. So uh, they decided, you know, they were going to ride the hot hand. What what were your thoughts there? Yeah, I I thought we might see Tyler, but I think, um, you know, this was not a game to put him in. I think that uh, it was was never like a blowout. They were up 19 at one point. But um, like last week when they put Tyler in, we all questioned why they put him in at that time. I didn't think there was ever really a good time to put Tyler in. I think he's going to get some moments uh, later on this season, but I didn't feel like today there was a good time to put him in. On defense, Terrence Lang played really well. Carson Wells played well, had a sack. Nate Landman was over the, all over the field again, making plays. Uh, we talked about going into this game, how we liked how CU's front seven would match up against Stanford in their you know, power running game. And, and sure enough, that really did. I mean, Stanford ran the ball really efficiently against a good Oregon front uh, in their opener, but they only had 70 rushing yards against you. Austin Jones, really talented back, only had nine rushing yards against the Buffs. Yeah, and you know we talked about this week. I mean, I think it was 20-some carries he had against Oregon last week and was never tackled for a loss. He was tackled behind the line of scrimmage a lot today. And I think it was three of his first four runs were behind the line of scrimmage. And, you know, it was a lot of different guys. Carson Wells, Terrence Lang, those two guys were, were beasts today. And I thought Nate Lamman, um, you know, played better than he did last week. And I thought he was good last week. So um, those three guys were really good. Uh, Jalen Sammy uh, does not uh, rack up a lot of stats, but he's played really well. That front seven is really good. I think that second linebacker spot has been, you know, kind of rough so far. I don't think Akeel Jones has played great. Uh, we saw Quinn Perry in there, uh, but they've managed to really get things done up front. And a lot of it is that defensive lineman and the way Carson's playing, the way Nate's playing. Even Josh Kagustoff had a nice play in coverage yeah. as well, where he played it really well. You know, Davis Mills goes out there and throws for 327 yards, but it took him 56 attempts to get to that number. I mean, CU was just much more efficient over the air. And, and I know there were a couple pass interference calls against CU, one of which 
uh, Darrell said was a bad call on Christian Gonzalez. Hopefully he doesn't, he doesn't get fined for that. Um, and the Makai Blackman, yeah, that's probably PI, but you know, probably, you know, one out of three times that doesn't get called and he's trying to be aggressive in, in, in that situation. Uh, overall, you know, the secondary is going to, it's going to have its growing pains this year. There's no way around that, but you're going to take a performance like this from them. I would think, you know, week in and week out. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I said, they're going to grow, but um, they're, and they're going to face better passing offenses. I mean, Dorian Thompson Robinson last week, he's a good passer, but he's not one of the elite passers in the conference. I don't think Davis Mills. Um, I think he's a, a solid quarterback, but we talked about this week. He didn't practice all week because of being out of COVID protocol. So um, he looked like a guy that maybe hadn't practiced and he threw for a lot of yards, but he was five for 14 on third downs, Adam. And, and you know, the Buffs did a great job on third downs. He was one for, uh, I think he was one for seven at one point on his third down throws. So uh, the Buffs did a great job on third down. And I thought that was one of the biggest keys of the game was uh, how they kept him down there. And uh, most of his yards came uh, late when they uh, tried to make that surge and uh, the Buffs did a good job. And how many times in the preseason do we hear CU's defensive players talk about third down, third down, third down? Obviously, that's an emphasis for any team, but it was something that Tyson Summers was really hammering home with these guys, um, and they've taken a lot of pride in it. The, the results today was pretty awesome. I mean, it's hard to get much better than that on third down defensively. Uh, any other thoughts on, on the defense today? Um, no. I mean, I, th- I think, you know, I think we covered it. I, th- I think Carson Wells, uh, you know, to me, uh, has been one of the keys to this defense so far in the first couple of weeks. And so, I mean, one thing I will say defensively, these guys need to catch the interceptions that are in their hands because um, you talk about drops on the offense, drops on the defense, I think have been even bigger actually because uh, they haven't they obviously cost this team games, but it might if they don't start catching those interceptions. They've had what, three or four in their hands in the, in the last couple of games and, and haven't been able to haul them in. So um, they got to catch the ball on defense and maybe that's why they're on defense. I get it, but um, they got to catch those. CU's kickoffs were short today. We're mm-hmm. kind of nitpicking at this point, but that's something to keep an eye on in the future. The, the Buffs coverage unit did do a pretty good job. That didn't end up being an issue, but you don't want to keep kicking it that short going forward. I, I think that would be a recipe, recipe for disaster and possibly a close game where you really need, uh, you know, where you can't afford to give up a big kickoff return. Yeah, and I thought um, Josh Watts, uh, you know, looks like he's a new punter. I don't think he's really gotten into a groove yet. He had a nice punt there at the end, but – um, you know, I think the kicking game, you know, you like Evan Price there, but, uh, you know, as far as kickoffs and punts, you want to see a little bit more, um, more from both of those spots. I, I don't think Josh Watts has played bad, but uh, I think that uh, you'd like to see a little more distance on some of those punts. You're out there in the Bay Area. What's, I think you're the only CU person that was even in the whole press box, and that includes the, the SID office, right? They were kind of all doing it remote as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, Curtis Snyder was out here, but he was with the team and not allowed up in the press box because he's got to be um, sequestered with the team to, you know, to be safe. So um, there was only about 15 people total in the press box, Adam. And, uh, you know, that includes the Stanford SID staff. So it's so not a whole lot. There was about 25 feet between me and the, the next person uh, to my left. So, yeah, it was interesting, uh, interesting experience. But, um, you know, it was good to be here. And it was, uh, you know, this stadium – you know, you were here four years ago, I believe, right, for the 2016 game. Doesn't get a ton of fans anyway, so it didn't feel a whole lot different with no fans. They had about 300 or something trees in the in the stands, which was interesting. <laughs> did you did they show that on the broadcast? Yeah, yeah, that was apparently they're getting donated somewhere after the season. Okay, well, it was I've never seen trees in in stands before, so <laughs> yeah. And now, Brian, we got to wonder about next week. Arizona State has an outbreak on their team. Their head coach has COVID. Yeah. We've seen the Pac-12 be a little bit more flexible now. Uh, I know Rick George is going to do everything he can to get a a game played at Folsom Field next weekend, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the earlier they can find out whether what's going on with ASU, uh, the better. Of course, to get another game, you know, that means another game has to be canceled somewhere because, I mean, you know, they need a, an opponent. So if every other game is played, CU's got nobody to play. Um, and uh, certainly we're not going to sit here and root for another game to be canceled. But um, I think that if something uh, else gets canceled, and ASU has not been canceled yet, but if that game against ASU gets canceled and another one uh, gets canceled, I do think CU is probably going to look to, um, you know, try to bring somebody to Folsom or go play somewhere. Who knows what they'll do. But I think, 
I think CU will do everything in their power to play a game next weekend. Arizona really tested USC. USC finds a way to come out of Tucson with a win. I don't know if that says more about Arizona be be being better than we thought or USC just not being very good. Utah has yet to play. Arizona State, you know, was really close to beating USC on the road. And they obviously, like we just talked about, had a COVID outbreak. So the South is up for grabs, obviously, with USC coming back there. They're in the driver's seat, although they have the same record as the Buffs right now. <laughs> right. Yeah, they're both 2-0, and and they, they face each other in two weeks in Los Angeles. So in, in theory, we'll see. Um, with, with COVID, you never know. But uh, um, that game in two weeks – <laughs> you know, it, it could be for the South title. Uh, we'll see. Um, but the Buffs certainly have put themselves in a good position two weeks in. All right, Brian. Well, safe travels back to Colorado. And again, uh, it's going to be an interesting week coming up here for the CU Buffs as they try to figure out who they can play at Folsom Field.